so we've come to the nicest part of the day, the creative bit. Um, it's been wonderful today, and some of us have been silent, and I think the silent majority have had a lot to say, but we've not been able to just jump in and say our bit. So hopefully there'll be a chance later on today to talk again, because this is such a rich field that we really need to explore it together. Thanks so much for the early presentation so far. And it's, we, now you, you've got the programme hopefully in front of you. We're looking at um, exploring Welsh black history through art and poetry. Um, I wasn't going to be participating, but because one of our speakers is not going to be here, I thought I'd share one of my poems. Um, and so that was what the couple was around, because we were trying to download it, put it onto the screen, and it's on Apple and so on. But we might get there later. So let's see. But before that, we need to welcome Jean Samuel, who's going to speak for us. Um, but probably I'll just say the others, because I'm, I'm going to introduce you first, Jean Samuel. Then okay. we've also got um, uh, Gareth. Um, let's talk about um, Where are you? Over there. So we'll have to um, no, But before that, we've got Matt from New Zealand of Wales. Where are you? Um, so you're going to introduce a bit because our speaker from Wales from the music Wales is not here today. And um, then we'll have the lovely Eleanor, and that will um, tidy this all up actually because everyone's got so much to contribute. And hopefully then we'll have a breather and enjoy the rest of the day together. So um, do you want to come forward and just have a look? Something happened, for example, in the Benin city in Nigeria, where the British 
That was in 1879, no, 1897, precisely in February, when the British uh, led an, ex um, an expedition and burned the whole of Benin City, looted their bronze, brass, ivory, and iron um, sculptures, and most of them were taken to Europe. You can see them, many of them, as we are speaking in London. All right. Other colonial masters like the, the Belgians, the French, did the same in their own particular colonies. I'm from a country called Cameroon, and Cameroon is in West or Central Africa. And at that time, the Germans were very influential in my country, and they took a lot as well from my country. And I'm going to show you some of them, especially the one that they took from my own village, where I come from. And we have been struggling for a long time to bring back these particular artifacts back home. But the ethnological museum in Germany, under the control of uh, the Prussian Cultural Heritage uh, Foundation, claims that it belongs to them. But we are still trying. Hopefully, someday we're going to get it. Okay. something happened that will forever be remembered by art historians as a significant moment in the history of modern art. What was it? Both of them realized that they had a particular interest in the post-impressionist paintings of Paul Cézanne and another guy called Paul Gauguin. And as they were talking, there was another third person there that eventually emerged, and this was his spirit. And it was in the form of a small sculpture that Henry Métisé brought to that meeting. This sculpture was later on seen by his historians that it originated from a place called, at that time, the Belgian Congo, today, the Democratic Republic of Congo. And for a certain village called the Ville Village in that country, and that is the sculpture. This was the first time that the great Pablo Picasso had a true direct contact with an African artifact like that, and it inflict its creativity in an astonishing way. I would like to explain here that even though at the time, especially Métisé was already very established, their artistic growth and progress was threatened by the developments in photography. Photography was becoming extremely very, very big. And uh, before this time, most of the art that was done in Western Europe was struggling, it was like trying as much as possible to represent nature with exactness. It was either realism or naturalism. After the Renaissance, everybody wanted to paint nature with exactness, making figures to be very round, remembering perspective, depth, and then proportion. And photography came and was doing this more than man. So the artists knew that if they do not adapt another way of creativity, 
then they may go out of business very soon. So when they saw this African mask, Papa Picasso, for example, he was very intrigued about it. He asked many questions. And after that, the following year, 1907, Pablo Picasso would spend his time collecting any African mask that you see. And he had frequent visits to a museum in Paris called the Ethnographic Museum, where many of these art collections were kept. He didn't only collect them, but he started copying them and painting them. He started painting very really aggressive paintings that looked more or less like wood or like sculptures. He forgot, he forgot a bit about three-dimensionality, bringing out vivid colors, structured cubes, shapes, and uh, many artists didn't like it because he forgot three-dimensionality and he was representing more or less two-dimensionality in a two-dimensional piece of paper, very flat, pictorial forms. But he did not stop what he was doing. Let me show some, yeah, I'll move to the next. All right, before this era, this is what Pablo Picasso was painting. But after that mask, he painted something like that. And that painting is one of the most famous paintings in the world. Forgive my French. He called it Le Demoiselle d'Avignon. Yeah. In good translation, the, three, the five prostitutes. <laughs> <laughs> when people looked at this painting, they didn't know what Pablo Picasso wanted to do. It was like a punch in the eyes of people who looked or who admired the beauty of the roundness of the painting before then. And uh, some art critics in particular identified the two other women on the right. They identified their faces to have been from particular African masks that Pablo Picasso had, uh, had bought, and that he had studied. And this painting was the beginning of modern Western art. It will later on lead to another form of painting called Cubism, which we are going to see later. All right. Um, even when people came and posed for Picasso to paint after that, he struggled as much as possible to make them look more stunted like wood, like the African art that he has seen. This painting is a woman, the same woman called Gay Justine, the one that invited Picasso and uh, Metivé to help them meet together so that this movement was created. Right. Um, his counterpart, Metivé, did not also forget to copy. Even though he made his own paintings a bit more colorful, but he still copied the African mask. If you look at this painting that he did, he moved from here to something like this, and he actually copied this guy from the village, village of the Democratic Republic of Congo in that painting. Now, the problem is that Henry Mekise never ever accepted or acknowledged that he was influenced by African art. At least Picasso in, in, in a certain place mentioned that when he had the first contact with the African mask, even though he called it the virus, the virus of the African mask never left him. That's what he said. But make you say in no way he never accepted or acknowledged that he copied or benefited anything from the African mask. He took all the glory, all the recognition, all the epaulets, all the money, and did not mention anything from Africa. And um, he, Mekize, had been going to Africa even before. He went there in, 2000, sorry, in 1905 to a place called Morocco, where he learned how to use color better. But he, has never, he didn't acknowledge in any of his writings or in any of his talks about his own work. He claimed the glory of the creator of the modern art. All right. When the years followed, you see, Picasso started copying the mask. Like, I mean, he used this mask to bend this. Use this one to bend this. Yeah, this one to do this bending as a, all his glory was because of the art collection he has collected from Africa. 
up to today as we are speaking, about 115 years, because it's five score, one ticket, and six years after that meeting took place. The African mass has not yet been given its glory, its recognition, and its praise. And its contribution towards the development of modern art. Every time I listen to auctions of modern arts around the world, and I even see some of them, I see my ancestors' creativity in them. I see my, their faces in them. But none of them is mentioned. I only hear the name of Picasso, the name of Métisé, the name of Josh Brack, and the rest. All right. All right. As this went forward, modern art became more and more abstractive. And uh, Picasso met another friend called Josh Brack. And they started thinking of how to do their paintings in the forms of cubes. And that is where they went to this style of painting called cubism. The two of them are considered to be the fathers of cubism, which is another stage in modern painting. The one in the left is by Pablo Picasso called The Musician, and then the one in the right is by Josh Brack. All right. When I started the talk, I mentioned that the Germans too were operating in Cameroon. Sometime in 1902, a German called Pavel, he came to Cameroon because of a punitive expedition. In my village in particular, the people were very conscious of their culture and they resisted German rule. So he came to my culture, intimidated the people, they ran away, and then he took this culture away. In 1903, he donated it to the Ethnological Museum in Berlin. As we are speaking up till today, the sculpture is there. Last year, many people from my village, called the Salt People of the Northwest region of Cameroon, they went to Germany, marched, complained, protested. But the Prussian Cultural Heritage Foundation claims that it belongs to them. So hopefully someday the truth shall realize. Um, we now realize that the African sculpture was very symbolic to the creation of modern Western art, but that it has not been recognized and acknowledged. All the glories have gone to the West. All the money have gone to the West, and everything has gone to them. When I go to different museums around this country, Berlin and Germany, which I do a lot of times. When I look at the paintings of Picasso in particular, I always see an influence from Africa. Even when I do my own paintings, some people come and tell me that I'm painting like Picasso. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. People have told me that you're trying to paint like Picasso, but actually I don't know Picasso is painting like me. <laughs> because I'm painting my experience, my roots and my heritage. My ancestors would be very happy to see that I'm projecting this thing. So I understand that it's a certain level of ignorance. They do not know any better. Especially because Picasso did not acknowledge openly where that extra creativity came from. Like this one is one of my paintings. This one, the one in the left. If you look at it, a lot of things are happening there in one single painting. And uh, I never forget the African mask in my painting too because I sometimes feel that I'm the African mask itself. And uh, I would like to explain something here. The African mask is not only a symbol of decoration or entertainment, it embodies the spirit of the African ancestors. It's something more spiritual than physical. Many cultures in Africa use the mask as a means to communicate to their gods, as a means to contact the spirits, or as a means of authority. When somebody is in a mask and makes a statement, he is not liable for that statement. He just made executing the laws of the land. But when the Europeans took it to their countries, they did not really understand the spiritual aspect of it. They just saw distorted forms. 
At that time, they called it primitive art, substandard art, or unevolved art. Some scholars find this very pro problematic today. Because at the end of the day, more and more artists are understanding that art is not only a way to reproduce reality, but a way to recreate reality as we want it to be. An artist can discuss form without reducing meaning. An artist has the freedom of bringing new, real new reality into existence. I think that the future of the world, if it's going to be different, will happen because the artists today who are imagining a future that is not yet there and struggling to visualize it, to create it, and to push people to that destination. Sorry. Um, I would also like to say that these are the last five things that you saw. They are also made by me. And the intention is to celebrate local black heroes in Wales. I, like we talked about our history. Our history is the Welsh history, is the UK history. Every year, or every year from now, with the help of the Race Council of Wales, I will try to look at a few people from African background or Caribbean background who has contributed to the history of this great nation so that together we can push forward. Thank you very much. Well, it's about widening engagement, firstly, 
working with the Art Council Wales, we've recently commissioned a report to look at how we engage with particular marginalised groups in Wales, Race Council Wales um, being one of those um, partners we worked with, and we looked at rural communities and we looked at um, one aspect of disability as well, hearing impairment, um, as another area. So widening engagement, we do still have a very white middle class visitor demographic, you know, why? We're free. Um, if I go to Chester Zoo, where, which is just down the road from me, we don't have that. But, you know, that's something we need to keep working on. How do we make sure this is everybody's house, it's everybody's place to visit? So um, that's been um, you know, an interesting one to look at. Partly it's about our existing collections and how we investigate those and decolonise them, such as um, you've heard about earlier today. And it's also about what we choose to collect currently. So uh, Naz will talk a little bit about that. And then what stories we choose to share and how. So one that you might have seen, but I'm going to mention just in case not, is the Picton Project. Thomas Picton, hugely um, interesting but problematic character. There's a big fancy portrait of him hanging in one of our galleries in our museum in Cardiff. Um, and Picton, um, what did we do? What should we do with that portrait? Um, so rather than us making a decision, um, we kind of passed that decision to the Sub-Saharan African Advisory Panel and asked them to come up with a recommendation on how they would reimagine what they would do with this portrait coming hanging on the walls. And I'll, I'll, if I just say that was, you know, against the social media backdrop of some fairly vociferous opposition to any change whatsoever, I think is probably, um, you can imagine, the, the rest. Um, but Picton, previously hailed as a war hero, today equally notorious for his cruel treatment of enslaved people um, during his governance of um, Trinidad. And uh, in January 2021, there was an open commission for artists, an open call for artists, to reframe the narrative around that portrait from war hero to something more representative of that total life of all those nuances. Um, and um, the museum kind of was hoping that actually these commissions would help to amplify the bigger picture and get other voices in. Um, so that is um, what is underway currently. There were 50 responses to that call for artists and two were selected to work um, on reimagining that portrait and it's going to be uh, re-displayed at some point this year. I don't think it's up yet. Um, again, looking, for, um, looking to, to check here. So that's, and that, their work will become part of the national collection. So, uh, so that's the kind of thing, it's not about hiding history, but using it and finding creative ways to give other voices a platform alongside the more problematic parts of our collection. So um, that's really what I wanted to share um, on the fly. Nazir, let me just introduce Nazir Adam. So he's um, curator of black history. I'm just making sure I get your job title right. Yeah. Um, since 2019, I'm like, um, you're the first curator with that focus, I think, yeah. in the museum's history. Um, I totally dropped him in it by suggesting that he should share some of his work with you today. But I think you'll find it um, really interesting to hear what the focus is. Thanks, Naz. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, so, so as Rachel said, is uh, I've just literally found out oh, five minutes ago that I'm actually speaking in front of all of you. So I tried to make notes like that, Rachel, with a couple of bullet points because it's been extremely busy over the last uh, three years um, whilst uh, we're working at the National Museum of Wales. Um, so for me, it was really about um, increasing the collections of uh, black communities all across Wales, so Pan Wales. So not literally just looking at the uh, you know, South Centric, is about really engaging with every black community and every voices in Wales and trying to capture that information, whether it's collecting objects, photos, uh, family uh, uh, relations. That was really important that we capture that information, but also increase our collections of, of black communities uh, across Wales. I think it's really vital that we embed ourselves, because I, I hate that term, engagement, because. It's all about embedding ourselves within our communities and actually being in there, showing our presence in our communities uh, and, and really yeah, embedding ourselves so we build our trust within our communities. But also one of the most uh, um, key areas for me was about uh, accessibility. You know, who, who's, who was missing out? I, I, I want to find out who was missing out in, in our museum in, uh, in terms of our community because we understand that 
it's not us that's got the knowledge, it's the communities that have got the knowledge. And it's about celebrating that knowledge and making that accessible for our communities in our beautiful spaces, in, 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 which it is, it's a public spaces, but showcasing our communities. Because I, I work in the uh, in, 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 in history and so social history of, of Wales. And it's about really reflecting and having a mirror reflection of our communities uh, that is, is across uh, in Wales. But the second thing is about valuing our communities and value and giving validity to their research. And actually, not only giving validity, but give, giving full research for, uh, and paying our researchers from communities and actually validating it that way. Because I think it's really important that, that we show communities that you know, we validate their experience and also their knowledge, because they, they do have the knowledge. Um, and again, it's about empowerment. It, it's really important for me to uh, give communities the power for, for them to decide on what, what exhibitions we need to put on in our, in our National Museum. So for one example, in 2019, it was a, a, a kind of a, it was all new to, to, to us actually, when I, set, when I uh, decided to allow the, the Somali community, which I am from as a third generation uh, Bosch Somali, proud to be as well, uh, from Beaver Town and Loudon Square, so it's lovely seeing uh, the history of, of, of Loudon Square. When we, we, when we approached the Somali community and said, listen, we want to have a Somali heritage day celebrating Welsh uh, Somali heritage, um, because the Somali community and other communities within Bhutan and, and across Wales have contributed so much to the Welsh economy, Welsh culture, Welsh music. We don't see that in our spaces, in these beautiful spaces in our National Museum. So for me, it was really important that we capture that information. And museums are safe spaces for people to have dialogue and we need to give people a dialogue of different perspective. I mean an example it was the, the Black Lives Matter uh, display and I hope when you all come down to South Wales please come and visit uh, St. Baggins to have a look at the Black Lives Matter uh, exhibition. Uh, it was one of the first in its kind in terms of Wales. We've had uh, you know, an amazing response but also quite negative my surprise but uh, we won't say it in a wide way. Uh, but it was amazing, it was absolutely amazing to see in terms of the young people, um, uh, and, and they engage them. I, I, I've just looked at the young people that are coming to uh, St. Baggins, all the schools that are coming, all of them taking photographs and, and commenting on say, I will say, I'll, and, and that's the kind of information that we want to have. Is It's not just for the black communities, it's for all communities to have that engagement. And I think it's really important that young people understand that black, when we talk about black history, it's not only just about slavery, and it's not only about just the negative connotation of the, the context, it's about the positivity as well that uh, we all share within it as a community. So my things gone off. So in terms of my key areas of, of, of focus, um, so one of them is the Black Lives Matter and how do we develop uh, the next phase of that uh, by capturing as much uh, oral history, testimonies, pictures, objects from all black communities across Wales. Secondly, it's about um, capturing the oral, oral the history. Because um, one of the things that I want to, uh, as a creator, I want to use is their testimony. So I'm, I'm not going to put my creator, creator's spin on it. I want it as, to be as raw and as, 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 because I think for communities, when they say their history, it's more powerful than me having to narrate it, narrate it, narrate it there, so put it in a different context. And it's raw, and I think it, it, it's important that we keep that uh, as real as possible and, and, and allowing the communities to have that uh, power. Um, but secondly, it's uh, about uh, expanding our collection and also in terms of our exhibition. So, you know, putting more uh, exhibitions in our uh, you know, museums over the seven sites. Um, but what's also really important is, I know I've got the title as a Black History creator, but I think, uh, and I think uh, all my colleagues and, and managers all understand is that it's everyone's responsibility. It's not just my responsibility to collect Black History, it's every creator's uh, responsibility to collect uh, Black History. Whether it's in textiles, whether it's in art, whether it's in social science, whether it's in uh, any field, we need to collect that, that uh, uh, representation and that mirror, mirror image. Um, and the second one is looking at the Windrush uh, Elders. Now we've already put uh, an exhibition on all across our site, in the Sam site in, in Wales. Um, but the second phase of that is really collecting their history and their, their testimonies of their lived experience. Because I think it's so important that we capture people's lived experience, uh, because we, we get that dialogue with other communities. If, if, if an individual is seen as a, as a community member and how they struggle, 
people are more likely to empathise with that and, and actually engage a lot more. Um, so that's what we're trying to do with, in terms of the Windrush elders, because I know in terms of our elders, you know, day in, day out, there's a lot of passing away, and you know, but the pandemic didn't really help at all in terms of uh, our local communities, especially those from my community, the black community. We, we have seen a lot of community members all passing away and losing that, as, as uh, things say, losing that history. Uh, and it's so important that we gather that information before and I pass it on to our next generation, our, our young people, so we could really instill this pride of who they are and where they came from and, and actually what contributions their grandfathers and their ancestors have made in Wales. And uh, that's also really important. And uh, so that's one of the things we're trying to get from not only the Windrush elders, but every elder across, uh, across Wales. Um, sorry, I'm trying to really capture everything that, uh, that, that we've been doing. <laughs> Uh, so, and the other thing is, yeah, I've said Black Lives Matter, uh, so uh, the Windrush Elders and then the Somali community is ensuring that uh, we capture as much history from the Welsh Somali community, but next it will be the Yemeni community, and I want every community to celebrate their heritage, and because this is, our, you know, this is what makes Wales, it, it's that uh, melting pot of all different cultures on, and different people all coming together, uh, that, that is what makes uh, our country, Wales, so great. And I'm so proud, honestly. I went to a museum association conference in, in England, and that's no offence to any English. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, I am, uh, yes, a controversial sometimes, obviously. But uh, yeah, I went to this conference, and it's just amazing to see about what kind of progress we're, we're making in Wales. So sometimes we shouldn't beat ourselves too much because we are making headways, honestly, compared to England and, and what's happening over across the border. It's uh, I've always said, obviously, that we're making so much progress, but it's only a start, and, and as, uh, to say, as a critical, you know, that we've got a lot more to, to do, but we are leading the way in terms of our four nations, and even uh, as far as saying in Scotland, I, I've, I've met with the certain museum associations, and everyone's kind of looking for Wales in leading in this position, so, which is brilliant, honestly, and we need to be credible. I always I'd like to end up with a positive uh, uh, notion, but there's a lot more that we could do, and I think... Um, you know, in terms of academic, there was a question raised by, um, I think it was about how do we all collaborate and, and become conduit in terms of academic, community, uh, uh, museum, uh, heritage, uh, art council. I think we all need to come together and actually celebrate and, and, and come, yeah, come together to work together to really, if we want to make a, an indent or make a difference within our communities, it's by all of us working together. Because I know from Butan, where, where I come from, where I was raised, where I was born, is that a lot of community, it is the most researched area within a square mile, it is the most researched area in the whole of the United Kingdom. And this, this is, a lot of communities don't trust outsiders coming in because they haven't, uh, number one is the legacy, they, they haven't been told this is going to happen, this is the sustainability, because it's always a one minute, uh, you know, one stop shop uh, uh, kind of research. But they want to know what the impact is, and what the sustainability is, how this, how this is going to impact the, their community. So, for future researchers, yeah, just bear that in mind, if you are going to go into a community, it's about really engaging and embedding yourself within that community and understanding where that community is coming from. And also, vitally important, is about informing the communities about the legacy of your project and how they're going to uh, you know, learn from that. Um, but all right, that's all I wanted to say. Uh, thank you very much. Okay then, so good afternoon everyone, I'm there. Um, 
again, just to reiterate, um, many other well, many other speakers, it's a genuine privilege to present here today, and to actually listen to all these fantastic talks that we've had in the room and over coffee as well. It's honestly, it's been um, invigorating, really. So um, thank you for, for for this opportunity, and um, yes. So just a, a, brief, a brief introduction, um, I'm Gareth, as Audrey said, um, I lecture here at Van Buurt, so I've travelled all the way across the, the parking <laughs> lot to this building. Um, yeah, I, um, I teach in the School of History, uh, Law and Social Sciences. And um, the paper I'm going to give today is, um, it's, well, it's come about from um, a recent um, project that I've been undertaking um, for, the, well, for the past five, six years. I've been working in the field of, um, of um, well, in particular, um, Welsh responses to slavery um, and Welsh language responses to slavery in particular. Um, that was the, the theme of my PhD. And um, excitingly, but also nerve-wrackingly, um, it's going to be published in July, so I've been going back to it recently, and um, yes, so by doing that, um, this, this particular topic struck me uh, quite interesting, and um, that's what I'm going to discuss briefly today. Transmitting the Sorrows of Yamba, an exploration of the influence of the literary character Yamba on Welsh anti-slavery writing, and I'll try to be brief. In St. Lucy's distant isle, still with Afric's love I burn, parted many a thousand mile, never, never to return. These are the opening lines of The Sorrows of Yamber, or The Negro Woman's Lamentation, an 18th century ballad that became popular among British anti-slavery advocates. Now it's attributed to Hannah Moore and Eagle Seal Smith, although it should be noted that the exact authorship has been a topic of great discussion and continues to be debated. So I must put that disclaimer there before we go any further. In spite of that, it is appropriate to say that the most familiar version of the ballad can be dated back to 1797, and since that year, the character of Yamba, who is depicted in the ballad, became a symbol or a stock character to represent female slaves in anti-slavery English literature. The poem depicts the woefulness of Yamba, a female slave, as she laments her present situation and as she longs for her home and her family. Now, The Sorrows of Yamber was a popular anti-Jacobin poem published as part of the Chief Repository Tract series. Now, it's interesting to note, as Annie Pearson does in her article, Anne Yearsley, Hannah Moore and Human Commodification in the Literary Marketplace, that the Chief Repository Tract series exhibit, and I quote, an implicit acceptance, an implicit acceptance of enslavement, end quote. However, Hannah Moore was shrewd enough and was severely aware of the tract's influence and potential outreach that she used that um, ability in order to disseminate an anti-slavery stance from this well, up to that point, pro-slavery series. Now, as Ivan Ortiz notes, I quote, Ballads had a particular political function in galvanising popular sentiment around pressing national matters, end quote. And it could be said that the creation and dissemination of the character of Yamba, the voice of a slave woman, and the depiction of a captive person became significant in the minds of anti-slavery supporters and developed into an acute counter-slavery position. 
Now the sorrows of Yamber, like the Negro's complaint by William Cowper, was set to the tune of a naval song, Richard Glover's Admiral Hosier's Ghost, for political effect. So too as to make the work more memorable by setting it to a familiar tone. Again, as Oritz notes, the melancholy imperial soundscape and narrative of Richard Glover's song struck an appropriate tone for Moore's political ballad. Indeed, Oritz makes a further significant point. The Sorrows of Yamber, like other writings of the time, include speakers who do achieve a political voice, but it is a British voice that reverberates the very imperial history that contributed to their enslavement. But the message that we see in the ballad is powerful and evocative, and it is a highly political and politicised piece of literature. Again, as Oritz comments, for more who supported an anti-Jacobin position with, within the abolition movement, Yamber becomes a spokesman for a conservative political agenda as she submits to the teachings and um, of the missionary. So, The Sorrows of Yamber features a distressed female slave who describes her pitiful situation having been made captive separated from her loved ones, witnessing the death of her child, and taken on board the slave ship along the Middle Passage. The narrative then tells of how, once arrived in the so-called New World, she came face to face with a white missionary and converted to Christianity. And I quote, There I met upon the strand English missionary good he had Bible book in hand, which poor me no understood. And I think that quotation is quite striking and reflective of, it could be said, yes, an anti-slavery position, but from an imperial perspective in the terminology used. Now the depiction of the slave woman, Yamba, being prevented from committing suicide due to the influence and teaching of a white Christian missionary who calls her to forgive, I quote, Master's sin, end quote, is deemed both racist and patriarchal by Damien Shaw, and is deemed emblematic of Hannah Moore's work. However, the poem became very popular in no time, and the character of Yamber was adopted by Welsh literature when Samuel Roberts of Llanbri Mai, the, well, the, the uncle of uh, the, the, um, the um, uh, Gohedid that we discussed earlier, um, he adopted Yamba in a free translation of the, the ballad, and it became Quinion Yamba Agithes the. Now the Welsh version was published for the first time in the denominational journal of the Sceptic, The Educator, in April 1813. Now, according to Wynne James, this was one of the two most influential Welsh anti-slavery poems of the 19th century, the second being Can a Negro Bach, the song of the little Negro by Benjamin Price, who was a Baptist minister and literateur. Now, Quinion Yamba Agithesti also tells the story of a slave woman, <coughs> excuse me, Yamba, as she becomes captive, loses her family, experiences the death of her child, and is taken to the new world. There, she is sold, and her situation is deplorable. From the outset, we see a contrast being drawn between the hellish present and the idealised past life in Africa. Er bod mewn caethiwed ymhell o fy ngwlad, rwy'n cofio hoff gartref y mam a fy nhad, y babell a'r gweidwig, yr afon a'r ddol, ond byth ni chaeth iamba ddychwelyd yn ôl. Even in slavery, a far from my country, 
I remember the dear home of my mother and father, the tent and the forest, the river and the meadow, but Yamba will never return. The choice of terms throughout the Welsh version is fascinating in many respects and roots itself in a particular type of abolitionist writing with ideological, religious and historical context. For example, the use of the term Dian Latron, man stealers, that carries with it a great significance and becomes synonymous with the Welsh anti-slavery agenda, especially during the turn of the 19th century in Britain and even more so in the United States from around the 1830s to the 1860s. Now the term Dian Latron is a variant of the phrase Llatron Dynion, thieves of men, that is reminiscent of 1 Timothy um, chapter 1 verse 10, uh, where men stealers are noted by the Apostle Paul as one of the many abhorrent people in society. When one remembers that Samuel Roberts Llambremai was a minister, it is no surprise that such a phrase was included in his work, and it could be argued that it is a reflection of the religiously political mindset of Samuel Roberts and the wider anti-slavery campaign among the Welsh. Now the focus on the loss of Yamba's child is striking and is, one could argue, paradoxically romanticised in tone, as she refers directly to her child who had been thrown overboard into the sea. For power beltithai o gyraith po baith, o deto mae thifan an wylaf yn gaith, pam rhwystru di yamba gael hyno yn llon, a'i sio i orthwys y mynwes y don. Many fled, like you, my child, from the reach of every pain, yet your beloved mother is enslaved. Why did Yamba be obstructed from sleeping cheerfully and being lulled to rest in the bosom of the waves? Interestingly enough, there is no detailed account of her conversion to Christianity or indeed the influence of an enlightened missionary per se as in the original English poem. Indeed, Yamba refers to Christianity only once and in the form of a question <coughs> that challenges the principles that Christians should profess. Which Christian, without feeling his heart in woe, can remember the black labour of his brother who is captive? The phrase, Evrotir, his brothers, is significant in this verse and ties into a greater anti-slavery and indeed abolitionist narrative whereby advocates of liberty would refer to slaves as their siblings. It could be suggested that the reason for doing so reflected the Christian belief that humanity was related to one another because humanity shared the same stem originating from Eden. Also, other passages such as Acts chapter 17 verse 26 states from one man he made all the nations, and also from a, a, a purely Christian perspective, the concept of Jesus having died for the sins of the whole of humanity. Now another fascinating element about Queen Yamba is that it also conveys a melancholy tone, with Yamba longing for her death. Indeed, this is to be seen throughout Queen Yamba. Now this reference to death and Christianity as two distinct concepts is emblematic of 18th and 19th century abolitionist writing, as Andrew Schenk states. Abolitionist literature by white authors often uses death and suffering of the suppressed, along with the influence of God, to exemplify a need to eliminate slavery. Ultimately, this literature targets the sensibilities of English, political or social figures that can enact change. This is also true 
for Welsh political or social figures and is indeed paramount when we consider 19th century transatlantic anti-slavery writing, such pieces published in Wales and in America. Indeed, what's fascinating is that the Welsh version of the poem had been published several times in the Welsh press in the United States, as well as in Wales, and Yamba evolved to have a developed stylistic function in anti-slavery writings. For example, in an extended poem, or preface, by T.B. Morris, also known as Gwynedd Bard, a bard of Gwynedd, that was awarded the first prize in the Utica Eisteddfod, the cultural festival, on the 1st of January, 1868. This poem was published in A Cyfaith for Him July, 1868, and in that piece, the poet celebrates the formal ending of slavery in the United States. In a dramatic fashion, he retells the story of Africa's children in slavery's shackles in the United States and how the Civil War was ignited for primarily the freedom of the slaves. In contrast with the captive situation, he describes the former slaves as being a darlin or winva, a picture of paradise, not living in fear of being whipped. And with this, he refers to the former slave woman. No longer dragging her chain is Yamba, in hope and liberty can this sister sleep. Again, that use of sibling terminology. Now it is striking that Morris conveys the background events that led up to the Emancipation Proclamation and the effect of the Declaration by using an established poetic measure from his motherland, the Prevest, to discuss an American topic. Also, that the character Yamba, who had been depicted quite significantly in English anti-slavery literature, here with a different aim, that Yamba was to be signified as a freed slave, no longer the, the slave woman. Therefore, the situation of Yamba was transformed. Another fascinating and earlier example is a poem by Gwilym Oneida, a studyithau ar gaithiwed ac anghyfiawnder considerations of slavery and injustice, which was published in a Cynhadwyr Americanaidd in May 1845. The purpose of the poem was to criticise the United States for its hypocrisy, sustaining slavery, the peculiar system, at the same time as professing liberty to all. The poem draws to a close with two short stanzas that deliver a final blow to the reader. And if we just remember, this was the time when slavery was um, allowed and legitimised well, from the, the legal perspective. O pwydritha fel y teimla meibion iamba mewn cythiwed, ond er gweitha gwlad Colombia a'i chydreithia, cant yn wared. O who will tell how they feel the sons of Yamba in slavery, but in spite of the country of Colombia and her laws, they will be delivered. These concluding stanzas succeed in presenting Yamba as the archetypal mother of slaves. However, it does not end with a melancholy note. Rather, it offers a strong radical statement that in spite of the, of the slave laws of Colombia, the government of the District of Colombia, the slaves will be set free some time. The sons of Yamba will no longer be like their mother. What we see in these various pieces, therefore, is how the character of Yamba, as depicted in 18th century English ballad, was transmitted into the realm of Welsh literature, ideology and imagination. Yamba became synonymous with the Cethes, the female slave, and in the Welsh American sphere came to convey the mother of slaves who became free. 
The significance of translating amber into Welsh is immense and ensured that the symbol, the symbolic character, the stock character, developed a stylistic function in Welsh literature of all sorts, political, creative, religious and sociological. As such, it is fair to say that the free translation of Samuel Roberts' Llanbri Mael was influential in the development of a Welsh anti-slavery rhetoric in the 19th century and that the character of Yamba developed significantly in meaning and impact in the realm of Welsh anti-slavery and abolitionist writings in Wales and the States. Indeed, there are other Welsh writings that depict Yamba that deserve to be explored further but that can be a topic for another talk. <laughs> Anybody who knows me knows holding my breath because I miss them. So that's very deeply moving. And I, I can't summarise it enough actually because I, I think words are all, we, we, everyone's done today, take our hearts away. And I felt my heart taken away with that present presentation. So thank you very much. Um, so we're going to move on to. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, thank you so much, Ellen. And you'll again introduce yourself. Thank you. And, we your presentation. Are you good there? Yeah, I think I'm Do you need any help with moving on to you? I can stand. Oh, you're good. Yeah. Well, um, yeah. Now that I've got the other power and the other power, I can get on and go and get on 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 and get to like my head is spinning as I think about well, what on earth am I going to say is my, my, my talk is going to evolve in three days. So um, I'm Eleanor and I have been curating with the National Trust for nearly the last four years and a lot of that time I've been working with Penryn Castle which is just a couple of miles away just outside Bangor. Um, and while I was writing this talk, I wasn't sure exactly how it would contribute to an understanding of what's happening in Black British history today. But now, having listened to you all, I think that it's going to be a summary of an attempt to put into practice some of the things, all of the things that you have been talking about today in the real world, which is tough. <laughs> and so there are a lot of limitations to what we've done. Um, but particularly, I think what we, what we were trying, or what I was trying to do, was um, insist that histories that are sometimes called black histories, um, you know, that they must be presented as integral to the existence of sites that are white majority or British establishment places, um, to focus on objects and on particularities in history um, and to approach that creatively. And also, I think, to make connections between what's happened in the past and then who we all are today. Uh, so, I also want to just recognise that I, we've, I've heard, we've all heard so much today um, about the work that's been going on in research and in public policy and in art uh, and in communities and, and so much of that is missing from what we've done. So, I yeah, look forward to going through it. So, uh, this is Penrith Castle. Um, it's actually a, a massive house that's been elaborately disguised as a castle and it was built in the 1820s for a man called George A. Dawkins Pennant. Um, it's the seat of, it was his seat of the Penryn estate um, and he inherited that estate from his uncle, Richard Pennant, who was MP for Liverpool and an owner of Jamaican sugar plantations, an enslaver of people uh, and a very outspoken pro-slavery campaigner. And so just to be really clear, the work of enslaved people in on sugar plantations in Jamaica generated the money to build this place and to furnish it. 
um, and in 1835, after the abolition of uh, slavery in the British Empire, uh, Dawkins Pennant claimed compensation for the loss to his asset register of 764 enslaved people, and that they might have included Isabella Thomas and Susanna Thomas, both of whom Dawkins Pennant knew about because he had received a letter telling him that they had given birth to daughters in 1819. Um, that was reported to him by the managing agent of the plantation. And they wouldn't have included people like Hercules or Chance who freed themselves uh, in the 1790s, a few years after Richard Pennant wrote a letter to his agent about some people who had declared his runaways, where he said, pray, what was the reason for their going away? So, the penance took the money that they had accumulated on the backs of enslaved African people and they invested it into the slate quarry, uh, which is a few miles from the castle of Henry Quarry. And that act transformed a dispersed cottage industry into a global business uh, and it reshaped the whole of the local area and the local economy. They invested in roads, they invested in rail, the facilities of this area, and they linked basically northwest Wales into a really fast industrializing Britain where previous and been really quite disconnected place. Um, and so this is a really dramatic painting from 1832, which gives a sense of the scale of the quarry, and if you look at the size of the people, and the vast number of people who are working in really dangerous conditions. And so these histories of enslavement and exploitation and growth and profit and consumption, you know, they're not unique to Penryn at all, but I think Penryn is a really concise expression of them all coming together. Uh, and some of it has now been, well, Penryn Castle and much of the estate has now been inscribed into the recent World Heritage site, um, which is for the, um, an, an exceptional example of uh, an industrial landscape which was profoundly shaped by quarrying and mining slate and transporting it for national and international markets. And enslavement and the contribution that enslaved people made to this area through their labor is mentioned in that bit, but it's not, you know, but briefly. And of course the legacies that's massive power and wealth and quality are still with us today in our global trade networks, in our structurally racist society, in our changing climate, and also, in the protected landscapes and the infrastructure which makes Snowdonia this amazingly popular tourist destination and, and, and a place that I want to live and all of these things. And also in our majority white museum um, and heritage sector within which the National Trust has been its major shaper of public perception of what heritage is, should be, um, and, and, and a British history. So um, the question that me and the team at Penryn started to think about in 2018 was what should Penryn be saying about all of this to our visitors? And it was evaluation of the visitor experience in 2019, which when our, our only interpretation method was people speaking to guides who were in the rooms, um, demonstrated that quite a lot of visitors were leaving the castle without ever finding out that it had any connections with slavery at all. Um, and part of that was because one of the only items on display in the castle with an explicit link to Jamaica, which is that this is one, um, it's a highly idealised painting of one of the Penance plantations in 1871, which uh, is really amazingly unusual to have something like that. It used to be displayed in a corridor, about as far from the main <laughs> and behind a lamp. Um, so there was nothing to trigger the conversation between guides and visitors about where the money was come, where the money had come from. Uh, and we were failing to convey one of the most significant aspects of permanent history to our visitors as a result. And then in 2018, there had also been a creative intervention in the castle by um, Mount Stefan Moss, uh, which had touched on the relationship between permanent and enslavement. And it was being undermined by some of our guides, um, because they, when they were speaking to visitors before or after their, um, their visit, sometimes because of a lack of knowledge, and sometimes just due to objections about talking about this kind of history in these kind of places. Um, so we had a lot to do. And I think at this point I would just like to, um, to take a moment to reflect on the, the process of that because we found it really difficult to be strategic, um, kind of working day to day in, uh, in a heritage site that's also a visitor attraction, and to think long term about how we wanted to do that. You know, those are such key parts of being good partners. Um, being ethical partners to people that 
that was really problematic. And we were really weighed down and kind of distracted by the need to be open daily to visitors and with a very like, limited team of operational staff. So my appearance on the scene, which was definitely much more luck than it was a case of planning or judgment, um, brought a foundation of confidence and concentration on the sort of issues and the, and the histories that I've just listed because of where I kind of previous experience. And it was that that helped us to develop and commit to a curatorial vision for Penland that ensured that the ways in which the Penland had exploited people and land to generate the wealth to build the castle were actually made visible to visitors. And that shaped the way that we took advantage of opportunities that came our way. We were very opportunistic. So some funding came to develop the work that the team had done with Colonial Countryside, which was an external project led by Corin Fowler, who's now Professor of Post-Colonial Literature um, at the University of Leicester. And Triam runs what we call our visitor experience in the castle. She sort of just, again, opportunistically grabbed the chance to be involved in that project. Uh, and then at the end of 2019, when some, some money appeared, because it was the end of the financial year, we were suddenly able to build on these like, very speculatively assembled foundations. So we created What a World, which is an exhibition throughout the castle, <coughs> along our standard visitor route, and still on show this weekend, if you wanted to go tomorrow. Um, we wanted to cast a new light on what's significant about our collection. So it focuses on specific objects within rooms, which many, many of which have previously been lost in kind of the dark and um, also their overly decorated corners of Penryn's interiors. Um, and the aim was to draw a connection between the Penryn that you see today and histories of slavery and culture of colonialism. So this is the drawing room, uh, which, and, and the teapot, which is on the box on the left-hand side of the screen, is the kind of, this amazing transcultural object, because it would have held Jamaican sugar, Chinese tea, uh, it's made out of rosewood from South America. The, the teapoy is a concept. It, it's a, it sort of was derived from British, uh, or, or, or the British took it from their uh, experiences in India. And it's a word that comes from uh, Sanskrit and Persian. So it's unbelievable mashing together, and it used to, uh, and, and a really powerful express, expression of empire. And it used to just be sort of displayed in a bedroom, just completely displaced. Um, the exhibition had collaborative elements drawing together creative contributions from 15 local school children and a number of poets uh, and using their work to inform what we displayed and how. And I, I hoped that poetry displayed alongside the highlighted objects would encourage visitors to look more closely and differently at them. So this is an Egyptian statue of Osiris, which is about two and a half thousand years old. And it was probably acquired by George Sholto Douglas Pennant during his travels in the Middle East and North Africa in the 19th century. Fatima's poem to me, at 11, she just nails colonial consumption, collecting of antiquities. He had money and I had history. His money bought my history. Um, so we focused at first on the creative process, which was all about putting time and money into supporting the children to really engage deeply with creative writing practice and the history of the castle and its collections and what these can tell us about the world today. And it was only later basically on seeing the quality and the sophistication of their work that it just, we just began, Tree and I began to plan how we would share it with visitors. And there are, like picking up on Charlotte for your presentation, there are really things that I regret about the way that we did it, particularly that we tried to do a lot of the educational work around slavery ourselves. Now, I have read academic texts about slavery and I have sort of gathered my own knowledge, but I have never taught it to children and I've never taught children either. So suddenly trying to communicate is, and, and, and you also talked about kind of, uh, I can't remember the term you use, kind of cultural amnesia. The, the inability sometimes to speak what it is that you sort of know but you don't know how to express, that was really writ large working with young people. And we worked with a fantastic creative writing practitioner who had brilliant experience of working with children, but he also had never worked around the themes of slavery. So that was a real, I think that was a mistake. But in terms of what we got right, I think that um, working with young people and through the medium of creativity, I'm completely persuaded by it. it was, you know, it's a cliche, but I found it to be true that the children's really fresh perspective on objects and their clear ways of expressing their thoughts and feelings opened my eyes and opened my heart and to the realities of what we trying to explore. So this is Leon. Uh, he's 11, or he was 11. 
and he drew a connection between a glass dome of stuffed birds and wider histories of colonialism and slavery that are central parts of Britain's past, right? So it is important to talk about these objects because some of everyone's history is dark, unpleasant, and brutal. Take a bird dome. They have taken something beautiful and treated it as if it was not living, as if it was property. This castle is beautiful. These objects are beautiful, but they come from cruelty. Some of them come from cruelty to enslaved African people. Writing these poems made me reflect and think back on the story of Penrith. I'm not a very emotional person, to tell the truth, but it's important to think about our past and other people's past. Why does this castle exist? We need to look at the beauty of the past, but also recognise our mistakes and build a better future. Why make the same mistakes again? And Alice, about the same bird zone, wrote in the first person, not from the perspective of the birds inside, which is what I would have done, but from the point of view of the dome. Her last paragraph to me seems to just express many of the questions that the white British public sphere are currently beginning to ask itself. What can I do? I'm just a glass dome. I am the one keeping their souls trapped here, but am I really the evil one? Should they resent me? Do they already resent me for imprisoning me? imprisoning them for all these years. I'm confused. So, like the majority of British adults, the staff and volunteers at Penrith, as has previously been discussed today, had gathered our information, or lack of information, about slavery and colonialism from all over the place, and the majority of us have received no formal education beyond triumphal teaching about the outlawing of the slave trade in 1887. So we use the exhibition to support the Penrith team to develop their practice of talking about this history, in a way that has led to a marked, marked, sorry, a marked increase in um, knowledge and also maturity of understanding. So Tequin, who's a volunteer guide at the castle, is one of the main sources of interpretation and information for visitors, said, being encouraged to know more about slavery was a very personal highlight of this exhibition. Putting ourselves out there as a place that is keen to acknowledge legacies of slavery and colonialism, has brought people to us who aren't our usual visitors and our volunteers. And I am extremely grateful to those who have come to tell us that Water World is not enough, because it takes a lot of effort and a lot of energy and courage to do that, and also of optimism that somebody will listen and act in response. Um, and it's through those encounters and you know, now sort of developing relationships that we've begun to realise how narrow our original question was. And that question was, what should Penland say about all of this to our visitors? And now, after sort of four years, we're starting to think, well, the questions are actually, you know, what, what role can Penrith play in expanding academic and public understanding of the links between slavery and industrialization and the legacies of that relationship in Britain today? How can we recognize the massive wealth that was generated for Britain by enslaved people and the relevance of Penrith to the task of, um, uh, of moving forwards and growing our own, like our, our own understanding, but also public understanding of, of that contribution. Um, how does this work stretch beyond our approach to interpretation? You know, how do we connect with others to respond to again to your warning, Charlotte, that um, kind of piecemeal and marginalisation of this history is is a real danger? How can Penrith challenge legacies of enslavement and inequality in our, within the organisational model of the National Trust, in the way that we employ people, in the way that we, you know, all of these things? And who are we serving? And why? Like, what do they need? And who else out there might also need Penrith, but in a completely different way to the way the National Trust is used to providing? So these are really big questions that you know require kind of philosophical and creative and practical and academic and emotional responses. And I don't think they can be answered without massive commitment of time and money and people's energy and license to try things out in an open-ended way and um, ideally support or at the best, I mean otherwise, indifference from senior management levels because that can be very undermining. Um, and I think as in 2019 actually it's very difficult for us to think long term and think strategically at the moment. We've got even fewer people than we used to have at start. So instead we're kind of grabbing opportunities when they present themselves. Um, whether that's a chance to meet new people or a little bit of budget at the end of a financial year. And it's really not their perfect way of working and I find it quite challenging. But what I feel like we learned from what the world was that um, if you bring a kind of open-hearted attitude, then it's worth doing it wrong. It's better than not doing anything at all. So yeah, thank you. Be awesome.
just seeing if I can open Audrey's poem. So ignore what's going on there and concentrate on it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Eleanor. And that was a, an amazing summary for, for us today. You're right. It might have sounded as not fitting in, but look how well it did. Thank you so much. And thank you for your continuing work, because I don't think you gave us a full introduction to who you are actually doing. Do you want to say a bit more? No, all right. <laughs> going to share one of my poems and then you'll see some of the resonances as well for today. But would um, the panel like to come to the front and so that we can interrogate uh, each other? We've got some new jobs and museums. Everyone who's working for this session. Let's get up here first. <laughs> Oh, you got you. So, where are we? I was intrigued when you showed that um, artistic response with a reflection in and what happened there. I missed your comment on what the tour guides would they for it or have difficulty with it. How would they respond to it? Um, we had quite a mixed, it was a, you know, it's a mixed set of people and uh, very different responses. Uh, the, the one I shared is a key. Many of them have taken it and run with it and have used it as an opportunity to open up, for, for, as a reason to learn about these and to, to realise that it's something that is relevant to them too. And I suppose that's why I find it hard to imagine what I had to contribute to black British history because it, like everybody I work with is white, but I think it has a lot to contribute to white British history. Um, so yeah, that was the gist. Would you like to say, um, sorry, take the lady at the back first, yeah. and then, um, hi, um, you want to say who you are? Oh yes, I'm Marcia, and um, I'd just like to say a wonderful presentation. So you know that this is the end where you were sort of like putting it out there, statements of we'd like to do this and we'd like to do that, I mean, I think you're reading from a uh, piece of paper. Um, that sounds like a strategy plan to me. That's where I'm coming from with that. So, so I know it sounds really strange. Is it possible to have a conversation? And then I'd like to them, yeah, it, I, I certainly have to share. I would say it's my strategy, it's your, it's but I haven't got anybody else's buying. No, um, so yeah, it's kind of. It's, I wouldn't say that represents where I'm really yeah. 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 the fact you're asking those sort of questions. That those are questions that you can see need to be addressed. And if I could just have a look up, that's fantastic. Thank you. You're first to move on. Yeah, I'm Alex Steve, and uh, my partner Margaret. We came up um, four years ago to uh, four times last year to Penry Castle. We had a big interest in it because Flint and here have a chairman from the Press and Black History Group. Uh, we had a great interest. The first time we came it was. I introduced to John, one of the uh, career commanders. And then the second time we got a young lady, something like so, who gave us a, a lot of information. We went around the castle and I was interested in the slave of how he went away. He didn't know anything about UK, he wanted to sail away. And he ended up in Jamaica. And when he came, he was supposed to be out there two years, I think, but he actually stopped five years, and he came back, and he wanted to impress, and he built this castle. On what we saw of it, uh, I brought back the information to our group, and uh, we are coming back in a couple of weeks' time with that. A recorder, and I'm going to do a documentary of the information that we know to bring back for our group. But what a presentation you get, and um, I really loved it. And I love the castle too. And I love the people that I met. Thank you. And I think sometimes some of the criticism that we've had sometimes is that we're teaching these young children to not like 
kind of, but that's not what happens. The more you know about somewhere and the more you feel connected to it through whatever work you've done with it, the more you love it and they love it. So I think, thank you. You're welcome. I think it was interesting as well, just for that little bit of information, of the box and a glass cage. And I do believe it was all the documents of all the names of the slave county maker. And he kept them. It was so important to him that he kept them in the dungeon of the castle. But now, this box is on show for the people. So it's brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. I noticed Gail is not. Yeah, th thank you all for your presentation. I, you know, I, I, I thought it was brilliant. Um, and two, two points. One, in one of the groups I'm in, there are two people whose last name is Pennant, mm -hmm. and they come from people who were enslaved. Um, and as you were talking, I thought, I could get them there. You know, I, I need to get them there just to see the work that you do and what we can get into that. That I think is brilliant. But the, the question I have for all of you, given the discussions that we've had before about making the links, I think you're all doing a brilliant job, a very hard job, you know, of looking at it. How can we better work together to help you in your tasks about making? buildings or heritage more accessible to a wider range of people. And I include in the, 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 the bits about art and those stories and ballads in, in that whole thing. I mean, uh, for, for me, I suppose it's about creating awareness for local community members, because I remember going out into the communities, um, a lot of them saying, well, why, why my story? Why, why, why do you want me to tell you about my story? So I think it's, it's really important that we, and this is what I was saying about us uh, being embedded in our community, the work with community organisations and, and grassroots uh, uh, activists and enablers. Uh, it's so important that we build that relationship and that trust. Um, and we can only do that by working not only with the, the grassroots communities, but with their uh, organisations such as yourselves and other community-led uh, um, well, organisations. Um, but it's really try, trying to because a lot of, of, of our, our community members, there's, there is an assumption that you've got to be someone important to donate or to give back to the National Museum, for example. And that, that isn't the case because, it, I mean, everyone has got the right to have their, their story told. And it's about creating that awareness. And you can only do that by working with not only directly with the communities, but with other community organisations as a collaborative. But I think it's really important as well that we start uh, funding local community organisations, uh, uh, more of long term, long term sustainability. So, yeah, I think it's really important that yeah, we just need to come together and create an awareness. Yeah. Does anyone else from the panel want to respond to that question? We will wrap up soon because we've gone a bit over time as it is. So, um, if we move on to the next, to good anything. Well, I think. Um, that this, this event, this type of thing, this collaborative and this chance for people to come together and, and discuss with one another, I think that's invaluable really. So I think the more we can hold events like these and have them more, um, have that forum to have that discussion and to create new, new uh, forge new relations and, and projects, I think that's the, definitely one of the main things that we can do. So talk, basically, just um, continue with that dialogue and talk to as many people as possible. Okay, just give you a note of the time because you've given me one. Um, do you want to say it? Sorry, I've been introduced. I know. I'm Only quickly, I, I, there are so many stories to pick up with all four of you. It's fantastic. I think I have spot on the talk. Can we create a little community on, on Teams or, or Zoom yeah. where we can connect really, because that's the one thing about this pandemic, we can connect up really quickly, really easily, every month, every six weeks, every three months, but, but I, I have these conversations, split it into subgroups, and work on these things to become more connected. We haven't got to be all brilliant, serial, but we haven't got to be all in the same room every time. We've got so many things 
I get tickled to the next, I won't speak no one during the YouTube. But I thought that was four fantastic presentations yeah. for, for, for completely different areas. It was amazing. I, I, but my battery's recharged today, it's fantastic. Thank you. We'll clap to that. <laughs>
This how you gone to their Scotland. This how you reach up there. Hungry belly. Catch boat come a England. Reach us out Hampton by the sea. Reach a London best suit. Be no walk till me back rock. Send for me woman, then kill me picnic. Be nothing. Me not see no sea, me not see no mountain. Rear so till. Down back home. Where they know me name, they know me family. Me a smuddy. Take me woman. Left the picnic. Them all right. But how did you end up here? Well, let it do. Make reach a lot, Wales. I've come a long way, baby. Back home. To the mountains and the sea. Back home. To Luke. Thank you. That was my introduction to myself. Well, the panelists can enjoy me bring it here when we make this on top. Because we've come with perceived ideas. 
So I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, still, as I say, still can't get my head around this. I mean, so the, 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 those ideas of, of connections and complexity and things that I've taken away today, um, and how, at the risk of being patronizing, how lyrical the Welsh language is, when you think the poetry. It took on it. Was a, it, was a, there was a, it was a beauty about it. But I was going to say, can I say this? You don't get that much in English. You know? <laughs> 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 no, it was beautiful. It was the Welsh language. So, so those, 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 those are my takeaways. So I'm going to ask my fellow panelists. Say, starting from the NPD name and, and, and the, your, your reflection on the day. Yeah, uh, I'm Jamie. Um, I'm just really glad to be here. I'm really grateful for the event. It, it felt like a very edifying experience. Um, there's just so much information I, I've taken on board today, and I'm still digesting it and processing it. Um, I've got loads of notes on my phone. I've just been, it, it's taken me back in some respects to my student days. It, it's uh, almost nostalgic. Um, yeah, there's a wealth of information that people have given out here today. And throughout the day, I was thinking about how best to disseminate this throughout our communities. Um, and I, I've got tons to say on that, but I could probably go on all day. Um, but I think about these things quite often on the interpersonal level and how. Um, Technology can be best utilised to actually get these messages out to people. In some ways, it's, it's kind of fortuitous that today is fallen on uh, Mental Health Awareness Week because, where did I go with this? <laughs> um, I think in this day and age, particularly now, we're bombarded with information from all sorts of directions, and everyone in this room has a, a vested interest or um, a passion expertise on the subject. <coughs> I occupy various roles in, in my community, and one of which puts me into contact with people who probably aren't so privileged in terms of getting access to information. And I see different sides to people who would, I think would otherwise be very sim uh, sympathetic and sympathetic with all our, our causes. So, there's a, there's a great deal of confusion out there, but I'm really happy to see people trying to correct these things and get decent information out. Um, yeah, yeah, I have loads of ideas, and yeah, but I don't want to take up too much time. So. But it's just been a wonderful experience overall. Thank you to everyone. Yeah. Yeah, good afternoon. Once more, I was just somewhere, and uh, actually, what I've taught me, what I've learned, and uh, what I want to share is um, the, the level of changes that human beings have attained. And uh, I saw a lot of truth being told, and no one was afraid to listen to it. Yeah, like the story about the Pepper Castle. It was a bit that truth made very beautiful. Because we now come from the perspective of, we are now predicated by the ideology that things have become just better. We are facing the past with, um, with no grudge. It's already there and it's very beautiful again, irrespective of what happened yesterday. I saw people taking custody of the future, irrespective of the fact that sometimes they're standing on blood. And I think um, the future will not be bounded by people who are just limited by the limitations of conventional reality. It will be conquered by people who can forget about the evils of yesterday or remember them just that they are not, they don't happen again. And dream of things that never were and say, why not? Why not? I kind of felt a certain platform. Uh, like, for example, I had a talk in Germany. And what I mentioned of the looted artifacts and the thing that happened and how some of the, um, these artifacts and most cultures of Africa and in Europe, some people took offense. But I, I am not intimidated when I tell the truth and people don't feel happy because they don't actually hate me. The, the problem is like their dual complex is being punched. And I cannot help them by custodying their ego or their pride that is based on an illusion which eventually will fade away. 
because history has proven that nothing would endure more than the truth, and the uh, truth crushed to earth shall rise again. That was William Cullen Bryan, and Carly said, "No, life can live forever." So I think that we are going somewhere. We are going to go somewhere. We have accepted our past with the intention of cleaning the future. Yeah, and I'm still very happy with the Penman Castle presentation. And um, we can also see that more than 90% of the people that started today are still here. And uh, these are adults with missions and visions. These are adults with a lot of things to do. I mean, they are not worried of the opportunity cost or what they are foregoing because they know there is something here that will be of benefit not only for them, for their children and their children's children. They know that tomorrow depends on discussions that we hear. I mean, it's not been boring. I'm always an impatient person anyway, but for some reason, something like a strange oracle will help me here. And I'm not regretting. So I can only say thank you for organizing this. Hope that eventually we'll get more of this. And, uh, that is how, you know, social transformation does not happen on the wheels of inevitability. It comes from the tireless efforts and dedicated work of individuals. And without this hard work, time will become an ally to the primitive forces of social stagnation. The time is always right to do right. I've not done a lot here. So. <laughs> University for about seven years, not just one degree anyways, and then I moved to Preston. And it's quite interesting to see that people have interest in black British history. And that is really encouraging, that is motivating because we live in a sensitive time whereby it is an opportunity that must not be missed, like Madame Gaino said. Um, so for the researchers I presented today, People involved with the museum, it is an opportunity. I like the information we've all gathered today. Um, beyond that, it's about the impact it's going to have. So I've learned about, I mean, uh, and again, we've, we've unlocked the British history from different lenses, which I really, really learned today as well. And it's an opportunity to make an impact. Uh, moving forward, there is so much to be done. It's not just the only way. That different lenses, we could contribute in different ways. And I've seen everyone here contributing by their presence, by their presentation, by everything. By being here, <coughs> there is a lot of contribution. And by sharing your knowledge and expertise with us is, an ex uh, is, is a contribution as well. Another thing I've also learned, sorry, I put down some things. Um, I like, uh, I like, I like, no, but, um, Proverb, when he said, when you buy a drum, you should also buy a trauma. <laughs> so, that for me is a whole lot. Sometimes language is difficult to interpret in English, but I think that's just the best way you could interpret it. Um, when you buy a drum, we have the history, but then we have to go out and do the work. We are the drummers. We have the work to do. We have the impact to make. And for me, this is a challenge for me as well. I'm going to go out there and make a change. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'd just like to say I'd like to see more young people like Talani doing history and um, sharing it, actually. Because, for instance, the Institute of Common Law Studies, I know there are probably not many black women or people doing that work. and. And part of it, I was, I was saying to Anne, actually, if I had read your book when you do write it, um, I would be inspired, because I'm a sort of person who likes narrative in history. I'm not very good at the dates and things, but give me a narrative. But, you know, I used to read a lot, so just to think of, I'm thinking of my younger self when I read that story. Uh, just um, hold on to it. And similarly, poetry, you know, some of us uh, are moved by creativity, and history can really hook us in. 
Um, and I was thinking, um, when I came in, and it's mainly white people, and I had to readjust my head because I was thinking, these are my allies. And I don't like war, but actually to overcome some of the grief that we're in, we do have to go through these problems. And so I am honoured that we're in the struggle together. And thank you everyone for being here. Um, and thank you for your commitment. And I, don't, I cannot name names because you're all so precious in the sense of what you're contributing. Um, so thank you very much. Um, the other thing, one of the things that um, the one of the Penring children said is that mostly that all our history is dark. And, and I think it's really important for us to remember that it's not me or you or, you know, us and them. For instance, when I moved to Barmouth, I discovered an ancestral um, sister of the slave-owning variety, and, you know, and that was coincidental, and we're best friends. Um, and it's, and interestingly, I haven't described it, but it's part of one of the things I was writing about before I got to Barmouth. A novelistic, so it was like, oh my god, <laughs> do you know, where do you start or stop? Um, but one of the things I was thinking back to the Allies was that Peter Fryer was one of the people who has documented black history. And when David Olshoot did his version of uh, black British history, I was thinking, well, he's sort of copied, but actually what he did was put it on the public stage. And I think if a book is hidden, we won't read it. If it's a big fat book and hidden, often lots of people won't read it. But actually, what we're doing now is making lots of histories visible. And that's really important, because different people use different ways of hearing and responding. So all the th that we're doing today is using the differences, the, the historical, the narrative, you know, various types of presentation to share our histories. We're all, it's our past, it's our dark past. All of us part participate in that. And I just, I've forgotten your name, but I want to remind you. Thank you for reminding me that I'm a therapist because I do the trauma as well. And so it's useful to go through the traumatic experience come out the other side. And I think this is where we're going on the other side. So thank you all for being here on that journey with us together. <laughs> One takeaway, one takeaway from today, and I'm going to share my takeaway. It's on uh, on colonial appropriation, theft, cultural theft, and the quote I usually use. I use the one about um, the, uh, the Afro. We don't know who said it. Chine Achebe or uh, uh, Jomo Kenyatta or, or Tutu, but it's, it's on the lines of when the when the missionaries came, they had the Bible, we had the land. <laughs> We closed our eyes. Now they have the land and we have the Bible. But you know, but, but it was so beautifully like Fatum about that, that eleven year old and she said, he, he had money and I had and, and I had history. His money brought my history. You know, come on. That is really from an eleven year old. You know, I'm gonna say, you know, this is really powerful. So that 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 that, 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 that that's my takeaway. So no pressure. <laughs> uh, I think I'd just like to reiterate what I was saying before about uh, I grew up in North Wales and I wasn't really privy to events like this it, in a strange twist of fate and I, I think I would have really appreciated events like these and just being able to see the, the level of engagement and uh, passion and compassion that people have yeah that's uh, it's just a lot for me to take in today. It's a, it's, a, it's a nice change of pace for me, I'll put it that way. <laughs> you take away? Well, my takeaway is uh, taking responsibility. Um, especially now that I know that I'm not alone, we are not alone. We seem to approach a common problem with different methods, but getting from the same direction. So I will take responsibility for sort of relationships I want to find in terms of race, culture, context of unity and uh, any other thing. I will try to be the change I want to see.
Yeah, my takeaway is just that, um, like I said earlier, there's more to be done. And it never ends. Um, but I've been able to learn from different presentations today uh, that we shouldn't just leave the responsibility to someone. I mean, like Naz Nazim, Nazim said, even though he's a black history curator, he has that title. It's not just for him alone, it's for everybody. So my takeaway is that I've learned from everyone, and I think, just like Sam said, I'll take responsibility. Um, it's a push for me as well to, to um, not to be afraid to tell the truth. And the reason why I've said this is because I find that today during the presentations, everyone was willing, they were open to listening to the truth. Okay, nobody walked away because something wrong was said, or they were not happy with anything. And even when we engage in pro with projects, with Grace Council Connery, and I represent them, and I think something is not right, I'll call Dr. Marion immediately, what do you think about this? And Dr. Marion says, no, 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 they're trying to conceal the truth. No, that's not right, they need to speak the truth. So I think that's one thing I'm taking from this place. Telling the truth, say it the way it is, irrespective of how, you know, how other people feel, feel about it. Um, so yeah, yeah, just telling the truth and saying it in the right way, and there's more to it. Um, I was thinking I was going to do a takeaway, but I will say that, um, because I can be stubborn sometimes, but I will say that um, I commit to the process, of the creative process, and creativity is all the things we've been doing today, and literally it's to keep going one step at a time, and so to finish the tasks that I've half done, God willing, <laughs> and to keep going on the other ones, you know, it's it's actually taken that personal responsibility. And I know I'm not alone, so thank you. Well, thank you, panel, for that. Now I'm going to throw it open to the floor. You've got an opportunity to make a comment on how the day, and then what's your take on? Well, I'm sorry. Thank you, Greg. So I think what's quite clear to me is that we possibly need the next day to be a steering group where we take all of everything that we, all these wonderful presentations and turn them into some sort of like educational resources and then plow those into the school. Um, that, that's where I'm coming from. It's created a big steering group, I don't know how big, but something, we create a group for this because we've started this conversation, so that's it. <laughs> yeah, uh, coming in today from Preston, it was a great journey for me, and since I've been here, and I've been a bit of an historian for the last three years on slavery and travel, and uh, the outcomes from the buildings as well. It's been a great interest, and I've learned a lot. And I feel now that uh, earlier, uh, I think it was this morning, we should have educate more. Uh, schools and colleges. I don't know what, it is, what, what it's like in Wales, how many you've got. But in Lancashire, I can't remember if you've got a number of schools. No. It's something we've got to go into, and I'd like to uh, um, go to some of these teaching. I used to teach wildlife in a school for younger people, but now I'd like to go back to that school and teach them about what the history of black people is. So today, it's been great. And from my heart, it's been a pleasure to meet you all and see everybody I've spoken to. It's been an education for me. Thank you. I'm Chris uh, Hemmings. Uh, I, I work with uh, uh, an organisation named um, Coal Bay, uh, so very, very aware of the Coal and Bay history. Um, the the organisation called the Warming Networking World Awareness of Multicultural Integration, which is kind of like a theme which could run through what we're talking about today. Looking forward, uh, the, the integration and the mutual support and the 
building a greater network and, and exchanging of ideas and so on. Talk earlier about the idea of globalizing the story, globalizing the story of oppressed people going, globalizing the story of the people who don't have a voice, not the lions, but the sheep, or the, the quiet ones, not sheep, that's bad, but you know what I mean? The, the, those that aren't the Quite dominant. Active, right? those, those aren't, well, yeah, <laughs> but those who aren't the dominant forces is what I'm saying. <laughs> because it's those people worldwide who haven't had a voice for so long and who have been, um, you know, suppressed in so many different ways, and it's not a good, it's not a good situation, especially in the present, um, the present time where globalist forces are at their strongest ever, and they are, they are actually gelling into a shackle which can, can literally stop any of the discussions that we're talking of now. But <laughs> what I, what my, my takeaway, apart from about 1,200 words on the mobile phone, which is notes taken at every single you know, part of the discussion. My, my, my big takeaway, well, there are two big things, I'm sorry, I found it. But the permanent, again, as a, as a Bangor graduate, and I went to school in Bangor, and known permanent class on the right, nearly. Um, I have to say that the, the, the more the story is expanded upon, the more I think that permanent castle cannot cannot stay in its present sort of situation. It's got to have a huge change in the perspective and possibly possibly just be um, close to the public and convert into housing or something like that. It's got to be celebrating. celebrating all the things that we are wanting to protect against, but it is constantly, you know, you change, change the way the history is recounted, but it's still there. <laughs> but, but the other thing I really wanted to say is, um, so I, I am, I, I have Pablo Picasso in such, so much better focus now. I, I would in future see Pablo Picasso as to the art world what Elvis Presley was to Rhythm and Blues. <laughs> 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 imagined that castle yeah. um, and you know as a Jamaican myself I think it's about time that certain colonial powers that still exist today should realise where they are and what they need to do and hand things back to the people who pay for them. Anyway, being less political, I'm actually here because I'm doing some work, I'm from Bristol actually, my name's Pia, and I'm doing some work in Bristol and Swansea for the World Reimagined, which is a project, a charity that seeks to educate people or support grassroots communities who've been doing the work in the field of racial justice for decades and also connect that to a wider education programme so that people can understand structural racism and the roots of that. So we're doing that through art and we'll be across seven different cities, so it'll be Leeds, Leicester, <coughs> Birmingham, several boroughs of London, Swansea and Bristol from the middle of August to the end of October. Each of those cities will have 10 globes telling nine different themes. So each, there'll be a different artist for each globe, going from Mother Africa, reality of being enslaved, um, abolition emancipation, complex triangle, echoes in the present, still we rise, expanding soul, reimagine the future, and a community globe. So I'm really here to say all the information that people have there is going to be a website where people will need all these different stories, information so that people can tap in and get more information about this history and how it leads to the present. Also, um, our friend here who's passionate to go into the schools now and teach, there has been a significant education programme, a learning programme, where there's been some really in-depth teacher training as well, so that's probably something that you can also um, get involved with. But yeah, do come and, I'm not going to stay for long because I've got a long drive back and I'm really hungry. My criticism is can we have some black British food next time? Oh, 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 o
we'll, do, we'll just increase the price of the entry to, to <laughs> 40 pounds. That was the list. There was a, a question over there. Just so I, I'd like to add a poetic quotation to your, the ones that you're collecting. Um, in terms thinking about all of the commonalities and the links between what we're describing here as Black British history, but what is in fact, you know, all history and certainly Welsh history. So um, a quote that is shared about the penance who took the mountain uh, and dug it into a massive hole and turned to slate quarry is uh, steal a sheep from the mountain and you will be hanged. Steal a mountain and I'll make you a lord. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Love to send me that like that one. Come come like that. I thought you might have been there. I thought you were going to add some more to it, then you just start getting... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a piece for itself. Oh, okay. I guess, um, yeah, I think just following on, um, this, this um, idea of coming together, effectiveness, but also this um, fighting different types of different peoples. And I, I guess that's, you know, coming into this collectiveness that we've been talking about from um, how oppression of all people um, and stepping together and being like, like um, Gareth was saying, brothers or um, allies uh, uh, across different oppressions. But um, that it's, I guess, a is the like notion of black history and all history. Mm. Oppression, all oppression, mm. it. it, 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 it um, we are all affected by the oppression of of others, and yeah. and, and, um, and I guess just thinking about the future and um, and asking the panel a question of what is your thinking about an imaginary future or a future where uh, you know a, a different future or a future where we can go from now. So. Um, Maybe it's through creative and arts, maybe it's through poetry, maybe it's through your specialisms. But I could just quickly respond to that because one of the things I'm trying to Sorry, we just have some very talented musicians out there waiting. Yeah, just a quick thing. One of my history teachers, I wasn't that interested in history, but my ears perked up when he said Benjamin Disraeli was the first Jewish prime minister, and when I was at school, I was like, what, 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 so what? And I would love that when we have a black prime minister way down the line and they tell the kid this is a first black prime minister, the kid will be like, what, so what, so what, so what, what does that mean, you know? So um, that's where I want us to go, where we see no distinction because we're all English and British or whatever we are. And it's so what. Okay, that's good.